Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2011 to 2012 series Static Shock, part of DC's The New 52. You might best know Static Shock for his animated TV show that was part of the DC Animated Universe, along with other great shows like the Batman and Superman animated series, and Justice League, both regular and unlimited. But the character was originally created by the independent studio Milestone Comics. Milestone's owner saw a drastic underrepresentation of minorities in mainstream comics, and hoped to fix that by creating their own shared universe of superheroes that would be set, primarily, in the fictional Midwest western city of Dakota. Really? Dakota? You couldn't have called it Dakota City? There's already a North Dakota, South Dakota, and Dakota fanning. If someone just says Dakota, how the hell are we supposed to know which Dakota they're talking about? Given Static's skin color and powers, a lot of people have assumed that he's somehow related to Black Lightning. But not only is that apparently not the case, it seems that was entirely coincidental. Static, whose real name is Virgil Hawkins, is named for the real-life man of the same name who was denied entry into law school purely on the basis of his skin color. His superhero identity is based on the James Brown song, Static, which was also probably the basis for his powers. And Virgil himself was created to basically just be a black Spider-Man. <laughs> a black Spider-Man. Who could possibly come up with such a thing? What nonsense. This inspiration would actually show through in all aspects of his character. Virgil would be a nerdy teenager, a wisecracking superhero, would have trouble balancing his personal and superhero life, and he would resolve his super battles with the aid of... SCIENCE! Milestone comics were distributed by DC Comics, and so eventually the Milestone universe would be folded into the main DC continuity. And from there it was only a hop, skip, and a flashpoint to the Dakotaverse being rebooted with the rest of the DC universe, giving us a new start to Static Shock with a new comic. Sadly, at the start of 2011, Static's creator, Dwayne McDuffie, passed away, leaving the new comic to be written and drawn by Scott McDaniel, though he did share writing duties with John Rosam. So will this new team bring the thunder, or will it just be more noise in the Static? Let's find out as we take this away. The comic opens on Static, already in action against this guy called Sunspot. As with most every other New 52 series, we're jumping several years into the character's superhero career. So instead of being a middle schooler from Dakota, Static is now a high schooler in New York City! joining Hawkman, and eventually more or less Supergirl, as protectors of the Big Apple. In his superhero identity, he is working for someone named Hardware, who Milestone fans would recognize as one of the first four original characters Milestone created. Hardware has decked out Static with some new, uh, hardware that includes his flying disc that can reshape into different patterns as needed, and also some kind of holographic display that Static can use to stay in contact with his new mentor. In his civilian identity, aside from attending PSM 101, the Dwayne G. McDuffie Center for Science and Mathematics, a nice little tribute to Static's creator, Virgil also works at the New York branch of Star Labs, which is why he was there when this Sunspot guy attacked the place, and why Static was able to get after him so quickly. Sunspot is surrounded by some kind of electromagnetic field that allows him to float and just eat right through obstacles, as well as not really be bothered by Static's electric-based attacks. Shoulda rolled with a ground-type Pokemon, buddy, but everyone's gotta be Pikachu. The normal moves failing him, Static plays the Spider-Man card and uses some SCIENCE! to defeat Sunspot, wrapping the baddie in an EM field of his own and using that to push him over to the Queensboro Bridge where he can ground the guy on all the metal poles there, thus short-circuiting his plasma ball. Alright, score one for science! The people on the bridge aren't too happy about this move though, as it turns out it fried all the electronics in the area, like cars and phones. Eh. I'm sure nobody really needs to get to Queens anyway. Sunspot is also pretty unhappy about it and starts screaming about some unknown they. And then that they presumably shoots him dead. Well, that's bad. The mystery of where the shot came from and how it was made is never really answered, but we zoom down to show these members of the Slate Gang who I guess were involved? The Slate Gang rides around on their stolen hover bikes and wear these color-coded outfits like they're some kind of evil Power Rangers. I mean what, do the hover bikes combine to form evil Voltron or something? What's happening here? 
The Slate Gang are part of a group of gangs that are joining forces to, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Become an even bigger gang, basically? This bigger gang includes a group called the Crime Alliance, who consists of members of the police force in the district attorney's office, and a would-be crime boss and off-brand killer shark named, I kid you not, Joey Piranha. They all work under this guy named Tan Young, and he works under a mysterious, as yet unknown, Kingpin. Worried that Sunspot may have told Static about their plans, the coalition of gangs decide they need to take the hero out. So the Slate Gang does a little research to learn that Static was originally operating in Dakota, but now is operating in New York. And so they run facial recognition scans on the hero in every person who lived in both places during that time period and determine Static to be Virgil Hawkins. I mean, like, duh. The moving was kind of a dead giveaway. Kind of being a little obvious there, Verge. Oh, wait, that says no match? Huh. The facial recognition scans failed to match him to his civilian identity, which might just be because they're using the nerdy picture of him from before he got his powers that is on his school ID. Which is only his picture on that ID because his sister Sharon picked out the picture for him. Wow, looks like your sister let you dodge a bullet there, V. Maybe you shouldn't be so critical of your sister, Virgil. Maybe you should recognize that she's been through a lot and you should try to be more supportive, Virgil. They don't go much into it, I'm assuming because they were saving most of the backstory information for the inevitable Zero issue that this series didn't end up getting, but we do eventually learn that while they were still living in Dakota, Sister Sharon was kidnapped. Static spent a lot of time looking for her and when she finally came back, she was... duplicated. Yeah, there were suddenly two of them for some reason. So identical that even they didn't know which one of them was really the real one. This is actually why the family moved to New York, so that the Sharons can be studied at Star Labs, so that the issue of which Sharon is the doppelganger and which is the real one can finally be settled. Presumably so the evil one can finally grow out their evil goatee. The scientist studying them at Star Labs is in no way suspicious looking either. Nor is he obviously evil, like in the way he completely disregards the patient's privacy rights so we can hear them speak in creepy creepy unison. I'm sure this super conspicuous rando who appears for only like three panels will in no way turn out to be a major supervillain. No chance. For the time being though, evil Interpol here decides that Static needs to go, so they send this giant guy after him named Viral. Viral is pretty good at his job it seems, as right away he gets a good shot in on Static that literally cuts the dude's arm off. Oh shit. Luckily, Static's bones are now apparently made of electricity, and those covalent bonds don't break. So a lightning bolt tethers the severed arm to him and allows him to reattach it without any lasting damage. Which is pretty crazy. In a later attempt, Viral also grounds himself by beefing up the lightning pole system on a rooftop so that Static's attacks can't hit the big man. Static finally deals with the big guy by luring him to a power station, where Static absorbs all the electricity at the station and sends it into Viral, melting him down into a gross little pile of boogers. This also has the unfortunate side effect of blacking out the city. And sure, the blackout was a big problem for everybody. I was trapped in an elevator for two hours and I had to make the whole time. I don't blame him, because once I turned into a dog and he helped me. With Viral out of the picture, we jump immediately to Static facing off against this villain named Gilatina. No really, Gilatina. There's no explanation as to how these two met or what got them started fighting, but it seems that at least partially she's a product demonstration for that Joey Piranha guy. Piranha doesn't exactly have a gang of his own, but he's hoping to build himself one. He started by partnering up with this Joker looking dude calling himself the Pale Man. The first time I read this, I just assumed the Pale Man was just a really obvious Joker knockoff from the original Milestone comics, but as far as I can tell, he was actually created for this series and isn't a big fan of being told he looks like the Joker. Turns out he was once a cop named O'Brien, but one day at a parade, the Joker had filled parade balloons full of Joker gas, and all the people were exposed in Joker eyes. O'Brien somehow survived, and somehow more or less managed to keep his sanity, and he was even allowed to keep his badge, though he was moved to working undercover. So the reason he's actually working with Piranha is he sees him as sort of the weak link of this Rico super gang, and so he can use him to gather information on everyone involved, and hopefully eventually lead to that secret kingpin. You might think that's important, but uh, it's not. 
To further build their gang, Piranha and Pillman purchase something called Q-Juice from a secretive dealer. Q-Juice, or Quantum Juice, is the mutagen that gave Static Shock his powers, after it was used to initiate an event called the Big Bang that gave a lot of people in Dakota powers. None of this is covered in the series, but is what happened in the original comics, and oddly enough, this series seems to be treating the original comics as canon. To that point, the secretive dealer turns out to be the original creator of the Q-Juice, Dr. Nemo, who shows up to make a deal for the juice with Piranha Man. Apparently impressed by Guillotina, even though she fails to defeat Static, Piranha takes the deal and uses the juice to turn a bunch of his men into supervillains. This mass of giant baddies aren't directly given names in the comic, but in the bonus sketchbook in the back of the collected edition, we learn that they're all named after car things, like crankshaft, cylinder, engine block, and even headlight? Ooh, headlight. Now there's a scary name. Beware the wrath of headlight. He might shine in your eyes and mildly annoy you. Make it hard to see your side of the road. Pull up behind you in line at the drive-thru and shine right through your rear windshield. What an asshole. Where was I? Oh yeah. Earlier during the fight with Guillotina, Static had planted some kind of tracker on one of Piranha's men, allowing him to show up now and fight them. Which gives us an example of some really awkward and bad narration box writing. When he plants the tracker, he refers to the men as rats. Then, like a dozen pages later, when he heads back out to do his superhero thing again, he continues the rat theme before interrupting himself to go on about other things, before returning to talking about rats with an ellipsis that lasts two pages, and finishes with him saying the next narration box out loud. Which was probably a mistake and meant to be continued in a new narration box and not be spoken. But that's a long chain of broken up narration boxes to try and keep track of. Comic writers? Please stop doing that. Piranha's new Superman get the upper hand on Static and drag him into the Hudson. Piranha then makes the typical villain mistake of not sticking around to make sure his target is dead, so when Static gets back to the surface, he has Piranha's man call in to say that Static is dead. Piranha reports his success to their secret kingpin, who doesn't exactly buy it and so demands the group kidnap one of the Lindbergh babies. Because that will for some reason confirm for them that Static is actually dead. I'm assuming this is a reference to the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby and not the name of something from either the original comics or this one, because it seems like what he meant by that was for them to kidnap one of the Sharons. Thankfully, one of Dr. Nemo's men, this alkali guy, who for some reason has the exact same powers as Static, is a turncoat and sends secret electronic signals and a breadcrumb trail for Static to follow. This leads him under South Brother Island to a place called Dark Star, where the evil mastermind is revealed to be... David Davidson! Who's David Davidson? Even if you've been reading the comic and not just following my chopped up review, you'd probably not recognize this guy, especially since this is the first time we even get his full name. But yeah, he's the suspicious scientist that was studying the Sharons at Star Labs. He's built some kind of gateway to a place called Nether Space, which is what Dr. Nemo was after. Remember him? He showed up, like, once. Captain Nemo over there also got powers from the Q-Juice, powers that gave him the ability to slip in and out of nether space. But recently, he's been slipping into nether space without wanting to, and is worried that if he lets his guard down, he'll slip in and never come back. Now he's hoping a trip through David Davidson's portal will fix that. But instead, everyone begins fighting amongst themselves while Static, Static's mentor hardware, and hardware sidekick technique, all break into the compound and all hell breaks loose. During the fighting, it's revealed that Sunspot is apparently still alive, not dead as I assumed, and that Alkali Guy with electric powers like Static is actually just Static's own doppelganger, just like with the two Sharons. Right at the start of the fight, Static got kicked through the event horizon of the portal, creating a double that fell back in time and decided to fall in with Dr. Nemo so he could take the gang down from the inside. The two Statics work together to throw Sunspot into the portal, causing an explosion that closes the portal and seems to kill everyone inside the complex. With the only survivors we actually see being our heroes, Sharon, and Gilatina, who has decided to become a good guy apparently. Even Static Number 2 seems to die in the explosion. Gilatina goes off with hardware and technique to train to be a hero, and Sharon goes home with Static where she decides to try and become her own person, asking to go by her middle name now and also making jokes with her sister clone about how hot Static is. Haha, <laughs> incest jokes. Incest jokes are funny. 
I said incest jokes are funny. Why aren't you laughing? The final two issues are just some filler issues. The first of these mostly just see Static chasing down this thief in Star Labs who can slip through walls. And he calls himself FaZe, Master of Density. Cool name, brah. Static manages to stop him by hardening the molecular bonds of the atoms in his body, which prevents him from being able to phase through things. Or, as Static puts it, with science, bitch! Haha, <laughs> I kinda love that. I'ma keep that for the future. Just in case. The final issue of the series is just probably what was intended for the eventual Zero issue, but reworked. It sees Static go over some of his history in Dakota and a little bit the first six issues as well, put in the context of him talking to his school psychologist, who apparently thinks he's either part of a gang or the victim of parental abuse. Which kind of makes light of parental abuse, which is awkward and uncool. That's a pretty serious subject. It's especially interesting considering that at the beginning of the issue, it actually opens discussing cyberbullying. Where these three boys here cyberbullied this classmate, who turned out to have superpowers that allowed her to turn the subway train they were riding on into a giant flying dragon thing. Which like, holy crap, that's the coolest power ever. And tries to crash it into New York's volcano. Yeah, New York has a volcano, which you would know if you read the New 52 Captain Atom. Or watch my video for it. Which, you know, you can do. <clears throat> and that brings us to the breakdown. It's interesting that Static was created to be a modernized Spider-Man because I think this comic perfectly illustrates why it's so hard to do a Spider-Man style story in the modern day. In old Spider-Man comics, you would cram so much story into a single page so that you could have more happen in a single issue than most comics will do these days in an entire arc. And that made it possible to focus on Spider-Man's problems with his family, his friends, and his job, all while also dealing with a ton of superhero action and shenanigans. This comic, in eight issues, barely even looks in on his family life at all. And we only really look into his school when it's meant to move the plot along. Instead, it's just almost all action, with Static fighting off one supervillain or another for pretty much every page. Which might still be fine if I felt Scott McDaniel was up to the task artistically. But while his art looks mostly fine when nothing's happening, I don't feel he illustrates action well, and there's often what feels like a huge disconnect between what we see happening and what the narration or dialogue is describing as happening. To drive the pain home, many of the issue covers are done by Kari Randolph and Emilio Lopez, the team behind making excellence so damn gorgeous to look at. And it's a real shame to be teased by this phenomenal team and then be left with art that is only just perfectly serviceable. I also think the New 52 strategy of starting essentially in media res well into some superhero's career wasn't the best strategy for smaller characters like Static Shock. Because if you haven't read his old comics, you're going to have absolutely no idea what is going on for most of this series, and even if you had, it's eh, probably still the same. I do appreciate a lot of the little things in this series though, like how everyone uses Q-Core's Q-Pads, or all the little phony brands like Sun Dollar Coffee, or the fake social media sites which we get a convenient list of here, like Hive, Facespace, Uspace, and my personal favorite, Twitterati. That's fun. But yeah, this will be one of those cases where my recommendation level doesn't really match the quality level of the comic. So to that end, I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... Low. There's nothing bad about it, but it's definitely not a good comic. And you'd probably be better off reading one of the actual Milestone comics, or waiting for the new series that's supposed to be coming out in the next year or so. The Collected Edition gets one, science, bitch! And you know I like that. While I may not be a fan of the comic itself, it is eight issues over the usual trade collection of six, and has 12 full pages of bonus sketch work from Scott McDaniel. If you did want to own this series, it's a pretty good book. Thanks everybody for watching, especially all you new people. I just hit 200 subscribers this week and that's pretty exciting. I promise I'm working extra hard to get to some of the requests you've made, and expect those to start rolling out over the next few months. As always, feel free to request something in the comments below and I'll add it to the growing list. Then be sure to click like and subscribe if you haven't already so you can be here for next time and I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.